After telling everybody that I finally read the Percy Jackson series, I had so many people ask me how it compares to Harry Potter, because my Harry Potter videos are really what made this channel take off. Because I'm such a big Harry Potter fan, while reading Percy Jackson, I of course saw many similar plot lines, characters, and much more while reading, and I wrote a fair few of them down. So I thought that it would be fun to go over those notes and turn those notes into a video. I wasn't sure if I had enough content at first, but it turns out I have more than enough. Rick Riordan, the author of the Percy Jackson series, actually addresses the similarities his series has to J.K. Rowling's. This is in an article on his website called, Did You Get That From Harry Potter? He says that he loves the Harry Potter series, and he admits that Rowling's series did influence his own work while writing his own fantasy novels. He explains that as a teacher, he was amazed at the effect the Harry Potter books had on his own class, and he saw that something about these books struck a chord with his students. Riordan says that his students would read the Sorcerer's Stone 14 times before they'd pick up another book, because they would say, nothing else is this good. Riordan said that he was mindful of what his students said made Harry Potter so great, and he kept all of this in mind when writing down the Percy Jackson story, which had actually started as a bedtime story for his son. He explained that he wanted to write a book that would appeal to them for the same reasons that Harry Potter appealed to them, which is why there are so many similarities between the two series. Heck, Riordan even had the security guard in the Empire State Building be reading Harry Potter. In the book, it says, he was reading a huge book with a picture of a wizard on the front. With all that being said though, most things that seem to be taken from Harry Potter are actually not. Riordan says that his books and the Potter books are taken from the same well of folklore and mythology. Rowling did not come up with everything in her masterful series. She took a good chunk of it from ancient stories that go back thousands of years. But for the sake of this video, we're going to take a look at the similarities that both of these book series have. Just to be clear, this video is not going over how Riordan copied J.K. Rowling. We're taking a deeper look at the similar influences that both of these authors used to write the respective series. Before we start, I feel I have to say that there will be major spoilers for both book series, Harry Potter and Percy Jackson, so there's your warning. Now, let's get the video started. Let's start with the basics. We have a young boy who is about middle school age as the main hero. A boy who starts out in the ordinary world, unaware of his powers or the magical world that awaited him. Both have dark hair and green eyes. They live in a home with a mean and nasty person or persons. For Percy, it was his stepfather Gabe, and for Harry, it was of course the Dursleys. The two heroes then both get calls to adventure, and they go to this magical place for special kids where they learn to fight and learn about the magical world. For Percy, it's Camp Half-Blood. For Harry, it's Hogwarts. Both magical landmarks have a huge amount of land, a big building, whether it be the castle or the big house, and both properties have water and a forest. The hero is marked as special and is a standout compared to everybody else. For Harry, this is because he's the boy who lived. And for Percy, this is because he's a child of one of the Big Three, something that had not been seen for years because the Big Three weren't supposed to have children. The hero meets two friends as they start their journey, one boy and one girl. For Percy, it's Grover and Annabeth. For Harry, it's Ron and Hermione. The girl is very smart and clever and sort of a know-it-all, and the boy is a loyal and good best friend. At this magical place, you get sorted or placed into a specific house, whether it be your godly parent's house or your Hogwarts house. Also, the thing that identifies what house you go into is something on top of your head, the sorting hat or the signal of your godly parent when they claim you. Also, each house has their own designated table where they have to sit whenever they eat. The hero has an old mentor. For Percy, it's Chiron. For Harry, it's Dumbledore. Also, both of them are mentioned to have a twinkle in their eyes. The hero goes on to have an enemy at the magical learning facility. For Percy, it's Clarice. For Harry, it's Draco. And both bullies have a crew behind them, whether it be the Ares Cabin or Crab and Goyle and Slytherin House. And on top of that, we meet the enemy's parent, which strikes a bit of sympathy into the hero, as we see that the parent is very cruel to their child. In Percy Jackson, it's Ares, who always talks down to Clarice. And for Draco, it's Lucius Malfoy, who bullies his son on a regular basis. Then we have the villain of the story, Kronos and Voldemort. Both of these villains were defeated long ago and were basically in exile, too weak to come back. Kronos was trapped in the pits of Tartarus, and Voldemort was merely a piece of a soul with no power and was hiding in the Albanian forest. Then, right when the hero begins their journey, this villain is threatening to make his return. Then we have the prophecy that this hero must take on. For Percy, it's the Great Prophecy, and for Harry, it's the prophecy that Trelawney made. And adding to that, both of these prophecies could be about somebody else. 
For Percy, it could have been about Thalio or Bianca and Nico D'Angelo. And in Harry Potter, the prophecy could have been about Neville Longbottom. We have two characters that mirror the character of Severus Snape. First is Luke. Both of them seem bad during the course of the series, but ultimately, they give their life and help save the day. Then, Snape can also be compared to Silena Beauregard. Both of them help serve the villain. For Snape, he was originally a Death Eater who served Voldemort. And for Silena, she was the spy who betrayed Camp Half-Blood and gave Luke tons of inside information, helping both Luke and Kronos. In the end though, both Snape and Silena turn to the good side and give their lives in the final battle, both dying a hero. And the thing that inspired them to do this was losing the person that they loved. In both series, there's an entrance to the magical world from an actual existing landmark. In Percy Jackson, we have the Empire State Building, which is the entrance to Olympus. And in Harry Potter, we have Platform 9 and 3 quarters, which you can get to through King's Cross Station. In both series, we have a man who works for the magical school or camp, both named Argus, and both of them see all that goes on. For Argus and Percy Jackson, he sees all because of his 100 eyes. And for Argus Filch, he sees all that goes on inside of Hogwarts with the help of his cat, Mrs. Norris. There's a chapter in both book series with the title of a man or a god with two faces. In Harry Potter, the chapter refers to Voldemort and Quirrell, and in Percy Jackson, the chapter refers to the god Janus, and the look for both of them is very, very similar. The labyrinth, filled with crazy, misleading, and confusing doors, hallways, creatures, and objects, is just like the Department of Mysteries in Harry Potter. Also, both of these places lead to a battle. In Percy Jackson, it leads to the Battle of the Labyrinth, and in Harry Potter, we get the Battle of the Department of Mysteries. In Percy Jackson, we have the Sirens, the thing that shows you what you desire. For example, Annabeth sees her dad, her mother Athena, and a Luke who never turned on her sitting in front of a city that Annabeth designed. It was used to lure people to their deaths, drawn in by what they were seeing and hearing. Then in Harry Potter, we have the Mirror of Erised, which has the same concept. It shows you the deepest and most desperate desire of your heart, and the mirror has led many people to waste their life away looking at something that would never come true. It's also worth mentioning that both the mirror and the sirens have an addicting quality that's hard to resist. We have many of the same creatures in both series, like the three-headed dog that guards something, whether it be the Sorcerer's Stone or the Underworld. And in both series, the heroes are able to tame the beast and get by, as Harry played a flute to tame Fluffy, and in Percy Jackson, Annabeth tamed and distracted Cerberus with a large red ball. We also have a black, horse-like creature with wings that only the main hero could see or talk to. In Harry Potter, it's the Thestrals, which only Harry and granted a few others can see because they witnessed death. And in Percy Jackson, it's Blackjack the Pegasus, who only Percy can talk to because of abilities he had gotten from his godly father Poseidon. There are also centaurs, mermaids, a sphinx, trolls, and so much more in both series. Almost all of the creatures that both of these authors used are of course from old stories and ancient folklore, so it makes sense that there's a lot of overlap when it comes to that part of their stories. At the end of one of the books in both series, we have the villain reveal who he really is and try to poison the hero with a deadly creature. At the end of the first Percy Jackson book, Luke reveals his dark side to Percy and tries to poison him with a deadly scorpion from Tartarus. And at the end of the Chamber of Secrets, Tom Riddle reveals that he's Voldemort and Harry ends up being poisoned by the Basilisk. Annabeth summoning the Grey Sisters to pick them up in a magical taxi is much like the Night Bus, which is a magical bus that picks up stranded witches and wizards. We have the theme of statues coming to life to help fight or defend. In Percy Jackson, they bring all the statues to life in New York to help defend the city in the final battle. And in the Deathly Hallows, we have McGonagall bring the statues to life to help defend Hogwarts in their final battle. And statues coming to life happens a few times in both series, as they help the heroes in Percy Jackson escape in the Titan's Curse. And in the Order of the Phoenix, Dumbledore brings the statues in the Ministry to life during his fight with Voldemort. Each series has one book that's dedicated to finding out the past of a character in flashbacks. In Percy Jackson, it's learning about Luke's past in The Last Olympian. And in Harry Potter, we find out about Voldemort's past in The Half-Blood Prince. In both series, there's also a character that uses a mark as their sign. In Percy Jackson, it's Daedalus using the Delta sign. And in Harry Potter, it's Grindelwald using the Deathly Hallow sign. And interestingly, both of these signs have origins that go well past the character using it, even though that character sort of claimed it as their own. Percy seeing into Grover's mind is much like Harry being able to see into Voldemort's mind, especially when Percy is dreaming and sees Grover running and in danger, just like Harry sees into Voldemort's mind while he's dreaming. 
And finally, both heroes give up something irresistible in the end. Percy gives up becoming a god and becoming a mortal, and Harry gives up the Deathly Hallows and being the master of death. Both of these stories are truly incredible and groundbreaking. I love both of these series so much, but because it's my job to break down books and movies, I of course had to compare the two. It's about how two authors dipped into ancient storytelling, looked at old folklore, mythology, and other forms of writing that have been around for thousands of years, and how they were able to make these very original and modern stories using such old information. For me, both of these stories are so original and so, so creative in their own respected rights. Thank you so much for watching, guys. You can follow me on social media to see more of my personal life and more of this little dude. If you like this video, hit that like button and subscribe. I want to give a huge shout out to all my patrons listed below. If you want to be featured on the next video, plus get a bunch of other rewards, become a patron today. Again, thank you so much for watching and look out for more great Movie Flame videos on the way.